Uh, what I want to do is talk about the issue of tax competition, but not the way I normally talk about it. Because normally when I'm talking about tax competition, I'm talking about the proposal of the European Parliament to harmonize the corporate tax uh, base. Or I'm talking about uh, things like the EU Savings Tax Directive to make it easier for governments to double tax income that's saved and invested. I'm going to talk about it from a little bit different perspective because I just came from a conference in Monaco where a lot of people were talking about this idea of a fiscal union. And a fiscal union is sort of tax harmonization, but instead of telling every country you have to have the same tax system, the same tax rates, you're sort of a cartel of governments, it's even worse because it's saying, okay, we'll just impose these taxes uh, from Brussels directly, uh, and there won't be any chance for competition at all. So that, that's what I'm going to focus on. Uh, and and to, let's start by defining the problem. Because I don't think there's a European problem. I don't think there's a Eurozone problem. I don't even think there's a Euro problem. I think the entire issue is that individual nations are taxing too much, and they're spending too much, and what does that mean? It means that their economies are not growing fast. And also, because your economy is not growing fast, and because you're spending too much, what does that mean? It means that your debt levels as a share of GDP, you know, let's think about this, you know, debt, debt as a share of GDP. The bottom, the, numerator, the denominator is GDP. That's growing slowly. The numerator, the top of the equation, is, uh, is your government borrowing while you're spending too much. You put those two things together and you wind up with international investors deciding that they don't trust that you're going to pay back money. So, so that is the most obvious symptom of the fiscal crisis that many European nations are facing right now. Their economies have been weak for a long time. They've been taxing and spending too much for a long time. But they finally got to the stage where people suddenly looked and said, wait, do we really think the Greek government's going to pay us back? No, we don't trust them. And we're not really sure we trust the Portuguese government, the Irish government, so on and so forth. And by the way, I think it's going to spread uh, to other countries. Uh, and the problem is, is how do the politicians react? Well, they want to make it worse because they want to have tax harmonization or a fiscal union. And they say, well, well, but the United States has a fiscal union. You have a central government with taxes and spending. They're right, but that was a mistake. If you look at US history, uh, we used to have a very, very small central government, and that almost everything was done at the state and local level. And that's when we were doing better. Switzerland still has, by and large, uh, a, a very small central government, and most things done at the level of the cantons and the municipalities. That approach works better. You don't want to centralize power uh, because that erodes competition. We used to have stronger competition among the states in the U.S. That was better for our economy. Switzerland still does have strong competition between the cantons. That's good for their economy. You look at the countries, though, where everything is centralized in the national capital. They tend to have bigger governments higher tax rates, slower growth. Well, you do that for Europe as a whole, and you're going to get in trouble. Now, some people, especially at this conference I was just at, well, but you have to do a fiscal union because you have to have transfers. How can you have a single currency without transfers? Well, the US did it for a long time. Yeah, we have transfers today, but that's been hurting our economy. Uh, Switzerland has some transfers between the rich and the poor cantons, but that also is a relatively new development. They were just fine for a long time, and the U.S. was just fine for a long time without fiscal transfers. In other words, what's happening is that the people who want big government are using as an excuse the current fiscal crisis to push policies they've always wanted. Because they know that if you get a fiscal union, they know that if you have direct taxing power from Brussels, that means bigger government, it means an erosion of tax competition, it strengthens the people who want more, more redistribution, and that would be very unfortunate. Now, let me go ahead and say something very important about growth. Because sometimes, I, I run into this in the United States when I talk to U.S. politicians. Well, does it really matter whether the economy grows 2% a year or 3% a year? And you know what? If you're going to die next year, I guess it doesn't matter. You probably wouldn't even notice if the economy was 2% growth, 3% growth, or 3 versus 4, or something like that. You wouldn't notice. 
But over a long period of time, it matters a lot. If you're in Italy and you're growing 1% a year, it takes you 70 years to double your GDP. That's just a mathematical formula. No controversy about that. If you're growing 7% a year, uh, you double your GDP in just 10 years. And if you have 5 to 6 or even 4% growth, you double your GDP uh, in less than 20 years. So it makes a huge difference. Uh, the example I give in the U.S. to try to educate our dumb politicians is I say that if you went back to 1900 and you simply took away one percentage point of growth that the U.S. experienced over a year, today the U.S. would be as poor as Mexico. Uh, so one percent growth may not sound like much, but over time, because of uh, compounding, which Albert Einstein called the most powerful force in the universe, it makes a big difference. And so the policies that the status are promoting of fiscal union and tax harmonization and bigger government, this is the consequence. And it's a big consequence, uh, especially if you're in Central and Eastern Europe where you suffered under decades of communism and you want to catch up. It's one thing for Sweden to have big government because Sweden from 1870 to 1970 had a hundred years of very small government and very free markets and they became a very rich nation. And once they became a very rich nation, they adopted a welfare state, their economy grew slower. But their economy grew slower after they got rich first. And so what I always tell people, if you want a welfare state, I'm going to tell you it's a mistake, it's the wrong thing, it's not only economically bad, it's morally bad. But if you're going to have a welfare state, make sure you have 100 years of free market and small government first. That way you get rich and then you can grow slow and stagnate. But if you adopt a big welfare state before you got rich, then, then you're in very, very uh, deep trouble. So, so what is it that we want to do? What's the definition of good fiscal policy? This is very important because so many times you listen to people from Brussels or from Berlin or Paris, you know, not that you should listen to them because they're hypocrites. You listen to the people in the United States. You listen to the IMF. Uh, everyone says the problem is deficits. The problem is debt. No. Deficits and debt are the symptom. The underlying disease is big government. If I go to the doctor because I have a headache and I find out that I have a brain tumor, and the doctor says, well, here's some aspirin for your headache. I want him to get rid of the tumor. I want to actually cure the problem. I don't want to just deal with the symptoms. So what you have to do, what you should do, is you should focus on controlling government spending, and the simple rule that you should follow is that government should grow slower than the private economy. If you do it the other way around, and government grows faster than the private economy, sooner or later you become Greeks. It might take 50 years, but you will become Greeks. Uh, on the other hand, if you have the private sector growing faster than the government, that's the definition of good policy because over time you are reducing the burden of the public sector, you're taking away excuses to raise taxes, deficits disappear, debt shrinks as its share of GDP, but who doesn't like that policy? Politicians don't like that policy because it means that they have less power, less control, less ability to buy votes, and that's what they specialize in. Uh, and there's even a, something called the wrong curve in the academic research about what is the growth maximizing size of government. And I actually disagree with this research because this research says that you maximize growth with government of 20% of GDP. I think that's wrong because I think researchers don't have any data on small government countries anymore. If you go out as a researcher and try to measure the size of government versus economic growth, what do you find? Well, you find that Switzerland and Hong Kong, I mean, Swiss, uh, Hong Kong and Singapore grow the fastest, and they're about 20% of GDP. Then you have maybe the US here, and you have France here, Italy here, things like that. But what if we had countries where government was only 10% of GDP? You know, the economists sort of assume this line here, but I think it actually goes up like this. I think government should be much, much smaller. But you know what? That's just academic theorizing. It doesn't really matter. You know why? Because all of our countries are somewhere on this downward sloping part of the curve. So whether you think the growth maximizing size of government is 20% of GDP or 10% of GDP, we're all at 35 or 40 or, or, or you know, in France, 56% of GDP. So, so all of our governments are far too big. We should focus on breaking them down to 20% of GDP, and then we can start arguing what, how much further we should lower the burdens of government. 
I said that there's a moral problem with big government. Here are two cartoons that I think demonstrate it. How does the welfare state begin? In all of our countries, the welfare state began with the same argument. Lots and lots of taxpayers can all join together and chip in a little bit of money each, and there's a few genuinely needy people that are going to ride in the wagon. And don't we have a heart? Don't we want to help people who are maybe handicapped or, or elderly? Isn't that the right and the nice thing to do? And we all say, yes, that sounds like a good idea. And there's so many of us who just give a little bit of money, and that takes care of these people. And that sounds so nice. What happens in every single country, though, over time, as politicians begin to figure out that if they increase spending for the people in the wagon, the people in the wagon vote for them. They increase spending on the wagon. Some people decide, I don't want to pull anymore. I want to climb in. What happens to the welfare state over time? This is what happens. All of a sudden, they're having a big party in here. There are fewer and fewer taxpayers. I mean, think of this as Greece. Think of this as Greece between government workers, although I don't want to say workers because they don't do any work, between government employees, <laughs> government employees, uh, people on welfare, retired people, and you can retire as early as age 48 if you're in a hazardous profession like hairdressing in Greece. So, so the retirees, the government employees, the welfare beneficiaries, everyone else who's butching off the government, they're more than 50% of the population. So if you want to do a prediction of what's going to happen to Greece, think about it this way. Is there any chance that a majority of population living off big government is going to vote for political reforms to make government smaller? No. No. You know, just, if you can go bet against Greece somehow, uh, do it. Because they're going to go downhill and downhill and downhill, uh, even though it doesn't make sense. If you're a parasite, you want a healthy host. If you're a flea and the dog you're on dies, that's not good for you. So all the people riding in the wagon should want to at least be a little bit nice to the people pulling the wagon, because if all the people pulling the wagon just drop the rope and walk away and say, mm, you, then you're stuck. The wagon's not moving. There, there's no, you know, again, you know, you're a tick. The dog dies. There's no blood for you to suck anymore. So, but, but the problem is nobody understands that. Because, well, maybe they understand it, but it's a tragedy of the commons issue. Tragedy of the commons, like, you know, there's, there's common parkland. We all own some sheep or cows. Uh, you know, none of us have property rights. So we try to make sure our cows and our sheep you know, graze all the grass before somebody else can. And that kind of system has bad incentives, uh, and all the grass gets uh, used up, and all of a sudden there's no food, and all of our sheep and cows die. That's a bad system. It's a trap. It's called trapping the commons, or nobody owns the fisheries, so everyone overfishes them. Countries that put in private fisheries, like New Zealand and Iceland, their system works. But in a welfare state, everyone who's mooching, everyone who's <coughs> trying to live off taxpayers, they all have none of them decide. Well, maybe I won't take as much. Why would they? Because it's a common pool of money, and they're all racing to live as nicely as they can off the work of other people. And then you add in demographic change. This is, this is why the welfare state is collapsing. We have, and I'll just, you, know, you don't need to read all that. Look at this chart. I took this out of a study done by the Bank for International Settlements in Switzerland. Very sober, serious bureaucrats, a lot more trustworthy than the ones of the IMF. And this simply looked at the, at the ratio of, uh, of old people to a uh, working age population. Of course, in a lot of countries, just because you're a working age population doesn't mean you're working. Uh, but look at what's happening. U.S., Japan, United Kingdom, Germany, France, Italy, Spain, and Greece. We all used to be down here, which I guess meant what? You know, four workers per retiree, if I'm reading that right. I'm, I'm not a math genius, so I don't know these things. But look at what's happening. You know, this is where we are right now. We're beginning to tip up. The baby boom generations are retiring, and look at what's going to happen. Can that work? Look at this. This is 0.5. That's sort of going to be the average of these countries. If every single worker is responsible for half of an old person, imagine the tax burden that that uh, would require for that to work. Uh, and this, these are estimates of how much government spending will, just age-related government spending will increase. Look at Greece. Again, I said bet against Greece. 
Well, everyone else was already betting against Greece or you're too late. Uh, but the U.S., we're in trouble. Look at Spain. Bet against Spain as well. Uh, and let, let's, look at the, let's look at the sovereign debt crisis. Uh, because it's really unfolding. Greece was the beginning. Ireland, Spain, Portugal. I think Italy and, and Belgium. Uh, well, actually, Italy's already beginning to happen, but I think Belgium is going to follow soon. France, probably after that. Japan. Japan's going to blow up. I don't know whether it's going to be one year from now, or five years from now, or ten years from now, but Japan is going to blow up. Uh, but, but all of us are in that situation. There's only a handful of countries, Australia and Switzerland, maybe Sweden, because they have private retirement accounts, they've reformed some of their old age systems, but for the most part, all countries are in deep trouble. And I'm going to show you some charts from this Bank for International Settlements paper that will really show it. Uh, oh, by the way, before I get to that, what is the danger point? for too much government debt. At what point have you spent so much money? At what point is your economy growing so slowly that your debt is growing enough that you get in trouble? Well, Robot and Reinhardt say 90% of GDP. Maybe that's right, but it's an average. It's an average. Japan is 200% you know, of GDP. They haven't died yet. They're going to. Uh, Greece didn't get in trouble to over 100% of GDP, but Spain and Portugal got in trouble at less than 90% of GDP. So 90% of GDP, think of it as a, as a benchmark in your mind, but not necessarily the danger point, depending on just how well run the country is. Now let's look at these charts about where all of us are today and where we're going. This is France. Uh, and again, these are taken directly out of the paper. The red line is the important one because that's the baseline scenario. That's what will happen if we just sort of leave government policy on autopilot. Uh, the green and the blue lines show what happens if you do adjustments, if you do reform, if you sort of uh, control the growth of benefits, you have people work uh, instead of retiring at 58, they have to retire at 62 or, or 65 or something like that. There's a, the blue line is with big, big changes. Let's look at France. Even if France does big, big changes, which we know they're not going to do, you basically have an election coming up where there are two socialists running against each other. You know, uh, so, so, so even if somehow the two socialists ran against each other, they, they ran into each other, their heads hit, they, they knocked themselves out, and somehow by magic a free market person was in charge of France, and they did a lot of reform. Even if they did a lot of reform, France is going to have, and this is just 2040, that's less than 30 years away. Again, you know, I'm not sure about my math, but I think that's true. So, just within our lifetimes, at least hopefully all of our lifetimes, uh, Richard there in the front row is looking a little bit peaked, so I'm worried about him, but hopefully he'll be around in 2040. Uh, so what happens in 2040? That's way above 90% of GDP. So when I said France is probably in trouble, look at that. Here's Germany. If they do nothing, now, if they do a lot of reforms, you know, they're, they're in a better situation than France, but they would have to do a lot of reforms to actually reduce their debt. If they do sort of a medium level of reforms, their debt still goes up way above 90% of GDP. So the Germans are feeling all cocky. Oh, we're the ones who are responsible. Everyone copy us. Just a matter of time. They're in trouble too. Uh, Greece. <laughs> We all know about Greece. Uh, really, we don't have to even say anything. Uh, I actually, you know, keep in mind, by the way, that the red line is the baseline. What if politicians increase spending? It is possible for the lines to go up even faster. So you know, the, the, the Bank for International Settlements showed options of politicians doing the right thing. We know politicians normally do the wrong thing. So there really should be other lines on top of the red line. Here's Ireland. Yeah. It doesn't matter what Ireland does. They're doomed. They're, you know, bet against Ireland too. And I say that, my ancestors were Irish. We came over in the 1800s to build the subways in New York City. Thank God we escaped. I wouldn't want to be there because I'd be being taxed to death uh, because the politicians have been reckless and irresponsible. Here's Italy. This actually surprises me. I thought Italy with their demographics would be in much worse shape. But they're, they're in very bad shape if they do nothing. But it actually shows that they can begin to bring debt down if they start doing things. Maybe. I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical. Here's the Netherlands. You think of them as being one of the more responsible countries? Of course, their government just collapsed because they're unwilling to do reforms. What happens if they don't do reforms? 400% of GDP. 
and they do a median level of reforms, more than 200% of GDP. Remember, 90% of GDP is supposed to be the danger point. The Netherlands, it's not sober, serious, responsible Dutch people. They're big spenders. They're Italians with blonde hair. That's all they are. <laughs> Japan. I said Japan's going to blow up and destroy itself. Even if they do a lot of reforms, 400% of GDP. Uh-uh. That's not going to work. So, so somehow, if you can figure out in financial markets how to make a bet that the Japanese economy is going to blow up, you'll get rich. The only problem is everyone else has probably already figured out the, that bet and so you actually can't make money on it. Here's Portugal, you know, that, not that line, you know, getting close to vertical. Uh, you know, they do a lot of reforms, they're still over 100% of GDP, so they're in trouble. Here's Spain, you know, doesn't matter how much reform they do. That's why I think that it's not an optimistic uh, bet for Spain either. Look at the United Kingdom. Oh, the, the Anglo-Saxon free market small government model. Well, in the land of Anglo-Saxons, that's not what they have. Government spending is about 50% of GDP in the United Kingdom now. That's worse than, than Germany. So you know, the continental model sometimes is actually better than the Anglo-Saxon model when you have a big bloated government. You know, look what basically happened. You know, they were sort of going along doing okay, and it's like someone flipped a switch, and then it was like setting off a bottle rocket or something like that. And here, I'm embarrassed to say, is the United States. You can sort of say, oh, this is back when Obama came in. But it really began before Obama. Bush was a big spender, too. One of the big things I always tell people, it doesn't matter whether someone's a Republican, a Democrat, a liberal, a conservative, a social Democrat. You know, whatever, whatever they say after their name sometimes doesn't mean anything because it's what they do when they're in power that matters. And if you're in power and you make government bigger, it doesn't matter what political party you're in, you're going to get in trouble. And you can see this in the United States. So what are the implications of all this for tax policy, by the way? It basically means we're going to have giant taxes, uh, but that doesn't work. And so what's going to happen at the end of the day? I think some nations will default and they're going to leave the euro. And I want to talk about why Europe cannot tax itself to prosperity. You already have very high taxes as a share of GDP. I know I'm going long, so I'm going to try to go through these slides quickly. Politicians think they can increase tax rates and get more money. Why? Because they have very simple, incorrect models. Politicians assume that if you double tax rates, you double tax revenue. Now let's do a thought experiment. Imagine that you run a restaurant. And you're thinking, well, this restaurant, I'm doing okay. I'm getting 10,000 euro a month from this restaurant. But what if I double all the prices of all my hamburgers and pizza? I double the price of everything in the store. I'll get 20,000 euro a month. Won't that be great? And someone who has an IQ over 10 is going to tap you on the shoulder and say, well, hold on a second. If you double the prices of all your food in your restaurant, maybe people won't come to your restaurant anymore. Uh, and maybe you'll actually lose money because they'll all go to other restaurants instead. And that's why, you know, this is the, this is the lack of curve. Your economy slows down. When your economy slows down, you have less taxable income. Less taxable income, you're depending on, the, on, on how much taxable income falls, you can raise tax rates and actually lose revenue to the government. Or it can go the other way. You can cut tax rates and actually increase. And I want to show you an example from the United States. In 1980, this is when the year Ronald Reagan was elected, and we had a very bad tax system. Our top tax rate was 70%. Of course, back then, the average for OECD countries was between 67 and 68 percent. So we all have terrible tax codes. So in 1980, with a top tax rate of 70 percent, we had 117,000 rich people defined as $200,000 a year or above. Those rich people reported $36 billion of income to the government, and the IRS, our tax police, got $19 billion. So remember that, 70 percent tax rate, $19 billion of tax revenue. Reagan took that 70% tax rate and lowered it all the way down to 28%. And the statists, the left-wingers in America, said, that's not fair. Rich people won't pay enough. The government will be starved of revenue. This is a horrible thing. How mean, how unfair, how awful. What happened? Again, 1980, 
tax rate of 70%, revenue of $19 billion. Tax rate comes down to 28%. Did revenues fall by the same amount? Which would mean they fell to about $8 billion. And that's the formula that the politicians use. You double tax rates, you double tax revenue. You cut tax rates by 50%, revenue falls by 50%. Read an IMF paper. That, that's what they assume. Uh, so what actually happened during the Reagan years? Well, and by the way, all of this data, you can go online this afternoon, irs.gov. I wouldn't actually do that because maybe the IRS will start tracking you down. Uh, they love to assume everyone's a U.S. taxpayer. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's risky to, to even say the word, the letter IRS. But if you do go to irs.gov, you go to the annual st statistics of income bulletins, you'll get all this data. So what happened in 1988 when our top tax rate was down to 28% and rich people weren't going to pay any money? Stop. Okay, well, I have to get this data though because this is really important. All of a sudden, 724,000 rich people, $353 billion of income they reported to the government, and the IRS got $100 billion almost. Five times as much revenue, even though the tax rate fell from 70 all the way down to 28%. Uh, you know, what, what do we need to do? We need to control the growth of spending. I mentioned that already. I want to show you some nations that have reformed really quickly. Ireland in the 1980s had a four-year spending freeze. Deficits as a share of GDP and government spending as a share of GDP fell. New Zealand in the 1990s, five-year spending freeze. What happened? Big budget deficit to a big budget surplus. More importantly, government spending fell. Uh, Canada, five-year period in the 1990s, 1% 1 spending growth. In other words, spending growing slower than the private sector. Remember that rule we discussed? What happened? They had a budget deficit about the same as the US as a share of GDP. Within five years, they had a surplus. More importantly, government spending fell as a share of GDP. So here's my final slide. What's the challenge for Europe? It's the same challenge we have for the United States. We have to remember government spending is the problem. Deficits and debt are the symptoms. We have to bend that cost curve of government down. But that requires, somehow, we have to convince people that liberty is more important than dependency. We have to convince people it's better to pull the wagon to produce rather than ride in the wagon and be a looter and a moocher. Thank you.